All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next speaker is Stephen Wong. He is the Chair Professor and Chief Research Information Officer at Houston Methodist Hospital. Please join me in welcoming Stephen to the stage. Patricia, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for attending these particular sessions. Uh, this talk, I'd like to talk something uh, quite different from the others. Uh, most AI is in healthcare very actively. Uh, most of them are, is in the administrative, uh, how to improve the administrative, reduce the complexity, improve the operational efficiency. This one I'd like to talk about is how AI can directly improve the healthcare. So, and let me open this section. So I have a mixed background in uh, 30 years, both in the uh, healthcare industry and also in academic medicine. So I, I, I took a perspective in both angles. Now the first one, we already know that this is very clear that we have a high cost, no quality, we pay double than our peers, yet our quality of life is, medical uh, quality is not as good as actually rank bottom for worse index. And in the government had actually put a lot of uh, regulations and, and policy, try to improve the situation for America and, uh, and affordable care. Now this actually go out to the rescue plan. Actually also in the in the industry, the healthcare is also changing the lens, the, 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 the underlift, you, you see more, more hospital consolidation, mega hospital forming to response the market changed and at the same time, as a consumer, as a patient, we actually asking uh, a lot of things that we are right. Uh, we, we're looking for uh, more engagement experience of physicians. We want to know our data. We want to more uh, eco assess uh, in terms of equity. Uh, look at uh, uh, look at the data itself, uh, accessible to the different different data set and services. At the same time, uh, especially in the recent pandemic, I think we know that our public health infrastructure is not really good. And in order to go for social economic uh, pressure is really, we want to actually improve our, our public health infrastructure and also population health. All these, I mean, these different forces, the cost, quality, macro, and the social economic actually pushing this healthcare transformation, the all landscape. And the, uh, this is a very, very complex topic. I just want to focus one area is the cost and the wastefulness. Different measure uh, by, by by different measure. I think we, we probably spend about a trillion dollars waste wasteful thing in in healthcare industry about thirty percent of our cost. If we break it down further, administrative complexity is one of the largest one, but also pricing or drug pricing particularly, fail to care over diagnosis over treatment, fraud, and abuse and and also coordinate care. And the question is really, can we use AI to counter out this problem, right? And it's a big topic. So I like to focus only two area. Uh, some, some case studies indicate that we have done in a hospital to show you about the failure of care and over diagnosis and over treatment. Uh, one, one area I, I, I like to focus on is the cancer over diagnosis, over screening. If you look at this data, if you look at lymphoma, Hawkins lymphoma and CML, and in fact, the mortality is decreasing, yet our incidence have not changed. That, that means that we actually diagnose a lot of patients, but we have not improved. Why the quality improved? Something is a lot of misdiagnosis right there. In the case of the prostate cancer, you can see when P PSA first come out, it's a suit up an instant rate until we figure out PSA is not the accurate, people start paying more attention and reduce it further. And in, in the case of viral cancer, in the last three decades, we actually have in US, we have seen a 300% increase in instance, yet there's no then change in the mortality. In our case, uh, actually in South Korea case, actually 700%. So all these are the issue of the over screening, over diagnosis in cancer. I like to focus on the, on, the, on the breast cancer cases. If you look at that, our mortality rate is actually improving, actually it's a good sign. And uh, but our instance rate has been a kind of Shoot up in the in the late eight late, late eight, early eighties and the mid um, in in the in the early nineties, for and then 30 percent increased, and this is the time that we we see a widespread of the breast screening data, and this thirty percent is persistent even we have reduction of the breast cancer cases. And to address this problem, we look at it. 
uh, case one, the breast cancer screening, we have 23 million mammograms done per year, about 270 new cases. And that's a standard called BIRAT to determine standardized reporting by American College of Radiology. And the issue of this is so far after two, two or three decades of data, we have solid data indicate the positive predictive value of the mammogram is 19% uh, to 31%. So a lot of cause of these biopsy, a lot of them, and you have 70% particularly in the category called BIREF4. This is um, the category, this category, we have 700,000 patient unnecessary biopsies. And it's by estimation, uh, there's a report that indicate about three or $4 billion. It's not just biopsy, remember it's all stand chain process. And biopsy may lead to unnecessary surgery or kind of thing. And also issue is patient feel very un uncomfortable. And when they find out false uh, biopsy turn out nothing because uh, actually it's increase of anxiety and no level esteem. So it's a psychological factor, not just cost money. So how to address this problem? We look at it, we use, take advantage of big data we have in hospital. So what we have is a standard, right? You input your features, define the AI model. We give a better score, more precise score and recommend whether you do biopsy or not biopsy. In the case in, uh, in Methodist, we have, we put a data from the PACS imaging data, uh, mammogram ultrasound in EMR, in this case, EPIC. Unfortunately, 80% of the data actually, what we want to feature is in the free text report. So we use NLP to, to retrieve the data. So we, uh, we got a quantitative imaging feature. We got a clinical uh, signature, demographic, all kind of information. All these features, multimodality feature, we fit into a database. And then we apply deep learning and then get a better score. And we have done this, uh, we first take about 22,000 cases, and then we filter out those missing data. And we, we have about 13,000, it's a very complete data set within our hospital in the last 15 years. And, and we, we, we're using some of them for training, validation, and separate them for testing. At the same time, independently, we have our clinics across the street, MD Anderson, they pull up their data set and as an independent blind study from them. And also in the case of a uh, University of San Antonio, Utah also joined, but data says a bit small. So we have a multi-center study on our model, trained by uh, our original uh, 11,000 patient data. And this is a result actually, we, for the BIREF4, we, we, we separate it in the further, in the three quick bucket, low risk bucket, moderate and high. In no risk benign, basically, our accuracy is, is very good, 99.8%. In moderate group, we got 93.4%. And high risk group malignance case is 86%. And all this, all this means is uh, we actually get a very accurate result and reduce significantly. Uh, in this particular case, definitely go for biopsy, right? I mean, but in this case, you really talk to the doctor and the doctor will talk to you whether it's worthwhile to take a risk and giving this a, such a high, high chances of false positive. So we basically, we reduce significantly and outperform, by the way, human uh, categorization accuracy by 25 to 33%. That's how the big data can do when you have a comprehensive big data and well-trained data set. And we also very careful about the uh, equity issue. So we make sure this model, actually, the algorithm is not biased to race. So in the Caucasian, Black, Hispanic, Asian, they all pretty much the same performance. So really a equity neutral. So how you implement it eventually is we create a calculator. This is 20 parameters out of the about 100 we finally filter out. Uh, and then from these people just key in their parameter. And then from there, they get using the crowd uh, and then they will calculate and then they give you an automator, right? Green is okay. Uh, orange you discuss, red is definitely we suggest you go for biopsy. And this can reduce a lot of significantly, right now we can reduce significantly 70% unnecessary biopsy. And this turned out to be about, if we implement world, uh, country-wise, in relation, you will save about 700 necessary, unnecessary biopsy and also anxiety and cost to it. At the same time, uh, we also do edge computing. Uh, in case people don't want to access to, to, to the cloud, you can actually do an edge, put a put an edge board, put it in there in, in the network. In this case, uh, you can do it locally. Either way, but one, one important thing I, I'd like to mention is the features in AI was uh, criticized being a black box. People don't know what the features are. In our case, different, we do feature engineering right up front. So all these features make sense to the clinicians. 
So have confidence they will use it. So this is very key, very important when you do a user design AI system in clinical. This one example. And my point is this, this type of uh, over screening in cancer or in other cases, over diagnosis, not just in breast, actually you can look at the lung estimates about $3 billion waste. Knee and hips actually $5 billion, thyroid is $1 billion. So you add up, you can see early on, I show you about $200, $200 billion type of uh, situation. We have the over, over treatment cost. These are why you add up each one. And the AI can provide a more accurate guidance, decision-making and reduce unnecessary procedure and do no harm to patients. And the second one I want to show you is this is a case of the, how you use the AI to, uh, to improve your, your surgical outcomes. In a sense, early on, I showed you about how to avoid, uh, 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 avoid the over, over screening, over biopsy, over treatment. Over, over. This one is in the case on the liver. Liver transplantation, like it, don't like it, is still the most common uh, uh, type for treatment for HEC. It's the most effective one. The problem, the current standard is really based on either UCSF standard or Milan standard. It's only a small UCC, less than 5 cm, a priority over the other. And we have shown that data have been reported, we show that consistently size does not really matter, but no one have a clear index of it. So we're missing a lot of opportunity to help this particular patient. And a lot of transplant, we don't know prioritize the right patient. This is life and death issue. So. The hypothesis here is really question is, can AI deep learning in this particular case, can we combine different image data type and clinical data set or need for transplanted patient can help predict recurrence free survival need for transplantation. If, we can, if they are not recurrent and there's a high chance they will benefit for this liver transplantation, even their size is bigger. And they suddenly open up a lot area for a lot of people who have uh, opportunity to survive on this particular deadly disease. And what should we do? We, we take the MRI, we do the MRI on the tumor detection before transplantation, after transplantation. These are feature extracted. At the same time, we also take the biopsy information. We digitize it through digital pathology. We actually basically analyze the whole big digital, huge amount of 100. This is about 200 gigabyte of data. You're analyzing, you, you look at tracing, uh, different type of thing and characterizing. So you do computer vision techniques in AI to extract uh, macro MRI data, pathological information combined together with the other uh, clinical information I showed early on, the same concept we have done in the breast. And you go for deep learning model and then combine together, get an index. And this is the approach we are doing. And the result is we get, a, uh, we, we get a, we've done a case study on 109 patients we achieve an 82% accuracy. Actually, it's not bad. We, we, and we compare with our method, with all the publish method, uh, our, method our, our method is will outbeat the other method. So these are the one approach that you can look multi-scale different images, take advantage of the PACS and EML data is already in your existing hospital and apply a layer intelligence to actually enrich, give you a better index who are the patient will benefit for liver transplantations. And this is the last one I want to show at a different angle. Okay, uh, this is a case study three, and this is on the misdiagnosis of acute ischemic stroke. Now, this is a one big problem in the country. We have about 800,000 stroke patients, number two cause of death, the cause of uh, disability in the United States cost tons of money. And in, in US, in the West, Western world, 80% of the stroke are uh, acute stroke. And, so a, a stroke actually is very different from, uh, from other diseases like Alzheimer, Parkinson's disease. Stroke is you have a lot of treatment, tons of therapeutic. And the issue is we don't know when we it is stroke so we can start treating. We have many options to it. So time is brain in stroke, just remember that. It's very critical. And the issue of today is about 800,000 suspected stroke most of them go to uh, about half of them, uh, about half of them will go to the so-called primary or comprehensive stroke center. Use a method is we have a comprehensive uh, stroke center. And this, this one are the only tip of iceberg. Uh, about five or 10 of them will, will, will do for anatomy. And the issue is the large population silent miss stroke. This is the one we're missing also. We just a tip of iceberg. How you can get this population, identify this population, which from here to here. 
And this is a, a big question to ask. And, but even within these 800,000 who come to the stroke center, 60% of them, and stroke in, in the ER room, and emergency room when you go to there, CT is normally used. The problem is the CT is difficult to identify if scheme is changed unless the infarct is very large. And the detection rate of CT is very low. The first three hours is pretty much uh, less than one third you can see in the first three hours. And most of the time you go through is non-contrast CT images are very noisy to see. And so at the same time, we don't have enough stroke specialists Neurologists stay in the ER room waiting for a patient to come, right? They are very busy. So in the, you, you have long specialists look at the stroke cases. Now, there's a gold standard called diffusion MRI, uh, only available in the, when a patient is a, mid, a minister enter into the hospital. And this may be at that time is too late. So the situation of, of the United States currently is go low, go stroke call in the ER room. So we tend to be over call 30% of cases, just in case, right? We're not sure. And actually, even with that over call, we still miss 20%. Uh, basically, we are saying that we miss half of them. It's flipping a coin. Uh, that's, a, that's a current state of situation. So we are thinking about whether we can leverage the AI to improve the recognition of stroke. And so we can deliver the treatment at the right place at the right time. And this is the challenge. In this particular case, the first issue, I remember I tell you that the CT is very noisy. Not, we don't use contrast agent in the beginning. Not contrast CT, this is, a, this is a standard of care you first come in. And some people do CTA now. A CTA is a, a somewhat a major ER room, but CTA only look at a large diffusion one. They, they miss the, the, the other one. So non contrast CT is still work host. We do a study, we take uh, about some training data for a data set and some of them for testing. We distribute 328 patients for our databases and we train 80 20 for training. And we're using applying uh, the deep learning approach to denoise the long contrast CT. And our performance, this is a performance. This is a gray matter signal to noise ratio, uh, white matter signal to noise ratio. And this is the um, DG, thermos, deep gray matters. Our performance here, the last one, the green ball, this is the one originally, the baseline, the long cross CT go to ER room. And the very noisy one is one. There are other methods, but our, our method indicated way past everybody. So, and uh, it's very, very, very sophisticated. And right now we do a large trial, clinical trial right now for a thousand patients in the case. If it works, it's very, wonder, very wonderful. I I just want to show, uh, show you quickly on this, one of the, uh, why this is uh, becoming a kind of a cases. If you look at the stroke cases like this, um, this is a case of the original on contrast CT. If I show you 90, this is zero hour, 11 hour, 20 hour, you probably don't see anything, okay? Even to train the YAL talk. Uh, if I denoise it, this after a deep learning denoising algorithm using the past large amount of data we have to train it. You, can, you start kind of seeing, right? This quality. Denoising means that your signal is still there. The noise disappear, okay? So you can see more the problem. And if I, if I see the diffusion MRI signal, this is 28, six hour. This patient actually come in for other reason and we find is actually the cause is actually stroke. <laughs> and um, this is the area. You, now you can see it very clearly. So this is a technique that is very powerful in a sense that you can save a lot of life and make, uh, make a decision much better. And another area, actually stroke is a big problem. We, we, we talk a systematic approach, right? You're you solving the imaging coming in, but this another area is uh, sometimes we, we look at the patient, especially when the imaging is not around, right? When you, you look at the patient, you look at the physical exam, look at the facial expression, you look at the voice, and you can apply multimedia deep learning approach. Look at the 3D facial recognition and the voice itself to determine whether the patient has a stroke. And this is exactly what we do. We actually took the patient uh, video, just a like ER, ER room doc, look at the patient, uh, how they move around, see whether any micro segmentation, many imbalance. Look, if you see, we are look, we're interested in the moderate, mild and moderate cases. If it's a significant case, even the layman can tell it's a stroke. But those are subtle case, this is the one we missed, 50%. That's what we have, I told right beginning. So this, we, we developed a video classification algorithm, um, 2D and 3D, we can able to detect it on base, we're training the data set, huge data set. 
At the same time, we're using uh, the, the audio. So there's a story called um, audio story uh, called, they read a story. Uh, this is a cookie jar story. It's a standard protocol, by the way. And uh, they were, the doctor will ask the, 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 the patient to read it. And based on the word they use, the pace they, they, uh, they speak and the abstraction, all these things, you can analyze whether the, pa the, 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 the patient has a stroke or not, speech pathologist, or a trained st uh, stroke specialist can tell. And we're basically using AI to automate the process. And we, we're using a whole script and we do, we've done this way. And I'll give you an example. This is a-, a In this picture, there is a mother and she's- She is a um, with clinical coordinator, stroke clinical coordinator. We try to simulate the cases. The so, so read this cookie jar this thing, right? In this picture, this is a there is pace. a mother and she's washing dishes with a dish rag and the sink is overflowing. And this is a case that she tries to simulate a patient. Mm -hmm. You see the difference. Um, there's another one. There's some kids. So they're not just the the, the pace or the, the tone is different. The wordings are different. They're, they're and the computer are able to pick up these things using AI. That's it's very important. So how you do it, I, I know, uh, we start, we are, we're combining diagnostic, but actually you can do it uh, there, uh, to automate the whole physical exam process. So there's a standard protocol called NIH stroke scale. And we go to hospital using it. And the urology will actually probably spend half, a, half, half 30 minutes in, or an hour per day just doing all these things. They may not like it, but this is the standard protocol. They, they try to do it. And this is a case that with a different procedure. I, uh, and you can either touch your nose, raise your hand, walking. And then they based on that, they judge, give you a score and then determine whether you have stroke or not stroke, the standard uh, thing. But we are thinking about it with create a 3D uh, avatar, actually. We are asking a question, can we automate the whole process so we can let the doctor do something more useful? Only after the exam, let, let the avatar to talk to the patient directly, right? And this is exactly what we do. This is just, a, just an iPhone app Please keep your head still and move your eyes to the right for three seconds and then to the left for three seconds. So we'll have the patient to follow through, right? And this is one of my MDPhD students. He tried to take example for this. And, and you can see, right, after this taking the video, the, the, the AI engine, the back to calculate whether the movement is correct. Point the camera to your face right? and smile wide. It's fully automatic. And so we standardize this procedure and, and get all this data in and you don't make decision. And then after finish it, you send the parameters, send to the physicians, uh, neurology. He, they may be busy looking at the patient. Keep the they, camera pointed to your face and the use the other hand to, to touch your nose three times. Switch hands and repeat for the other hand. So, yeah, uh, let me skip a little bit. In front of you and this walk in a straight one. line yeah. for 10 seconds. There, there's one, a different way of doing things. 10, right? nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, finished. And after all these things, the computer calculate give you, give you a score, right? Each task, pass, not pass, but we don't make judgment. Uh, this, is a, this is really a deep medicine, right? It's kind of augmented the physician. But you let the physician do something else, don't occupy their time doing this maintain task. And this is a virtual physical exam, and you can imagine this can apply to other things, right? You can do virtual physical therapy, virtual other thing. Uh, and we, the, the one I mentioned early on using facial and using voice to detect the patient, actually we do a small clinical trial. We've done on the 84 patients, uh, quite balanced, male and female, and suspicious stroke. And then we actually, the result indicated, our, our result, this clinical impression is done by Yao Doc, okay? He has all information, traditional imaging, seeing patient, all kind of thing, okay? They got only, COVID right, only 73%. Our system, just using video and audio, that's 79%. It's very accuracy. Specificity is all, and, and the sensitivity is very good. That's very important. And uh, so in the case, this is quite exciting world for AI applying in changing, changing the healthcare, actually directly see how the deep medicine and less medicine, two things together, can actually improve the healthcare significant, not just cost, but in quality. I'd like to thank my colleague, my my uh, my 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 group in uh, in my department, and and uh, my colleagues in cancer center, stroke center, and transplant 
center and IT people. I saw my colleagues in across uh, Street Angus and 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 uh, San Antonio and Penn State. Uh, this is funded by NIH, part of part of the project and the other project in the foundation. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Bye bye. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for sharing this with us. If you could stop sharing your slides, the audience is going to give you a huge virtual round of applause. So I stop. Let me close it. Yeah. Done. Perfect. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and stop by our amazing AI exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.